Jeffrey Dudgeon, MBE, is an author, historian, convener of the Malone House Group, and gay rights activist. Jeff took a case to the European Court of Human Rights in 1976, Dudgeon v. United Kingdom, on the grounds that his private life as a gay man was being denied in breach of Article 8 of the Convention on Human Rights. Jeff won his case eventually in 1981. The next year, the Homosexual Offences Order in 1982 brought the law in Northern Ireland into line with that in England and Wales. Scotland decriminalised in 1980. His case was the key precedent used in the Norris v. Ireland application lodged with the European Court at Strasbourg in 1983. And before we get started, just want to let some of the people watching know that we will be talking about sexual abuse of minors in the course of our discussion here. So if anybody feels that that's an issue that they're uncomfortable with, you might want to maybe just kind of switch off for a little while, come back to us in about you know five or ten minutes uh, when we have continued on with the conversation. Okay, so let me just set the background for this. The Kinkora uh, Boys' Home was a care facility for working boys in Belfast, Northern Ireland. In January 1980, reports started to emerge of sexual abuse of the boys by staff in the home, three of whom were uh, convicted and jailed. A shocking story of child sexual abuse was exposed. State cover-up and the dis uh, destruction of the lives of the boys. Later, a witch hunt ensued uh, of care workers who identified as gay or bisexual or who might be seeking uh, such employment. Jeff, I'm kind of given a, a, a very quick overview of what the issue around the Concora Boys Home is all about. Could you fill it in a bit more and just kind of explain it better for people? Right, Carl. Uh, as was stated, it was a boys' home. There was a, a, a newspaper, that actually it was the Irish Independent, uh, broke the story that there had been uh, misbehaviour of a serious nature at the home in, I think, 1980. Uh, and it, it, it ballooned, in a sense, from there, because cause quite quickly the police moved in and arrested and convicted uh, the three individuals who were named. Um, and in that sense, the, 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 um, the problem was solved in respect of the immediate problem was solved, but, but the fact remained that there, there had to be an inquiry into why this, this abuse had continued over, over a number of years and in other boys' homes, um, um, not just <clears throat> state homes, but also religious homes. Uh, so, in fact, there's been a series of about six inquiries into Kinkora and the whole thing finalised in the uh, Hart, Anthony's, Judge Anthony Hart inquiry, which reported about four years ago uh, after a very lengthy uh, process and uh, published a, a report which is available on the internet if you've got several days it would take to read, read all the chapters. But there's two or three chapters particularly on Kinkora and it, it, it lays out the whole issue and, uh, uh, and what exactly happened. And it also nails a lot of the conspiracy theories uh, evidentially and says that there's nothing, there was no, there was no, there was certainly no fire in, in these areas. Following that, there, there was the um, decision to try and eliminate anybody who identified as gay or bisexual males uh, from working in the care sector. How did that come about? Like, what, do, is there any indication as to what the thinking was behind that? Uh, uh, there's prejudice, I think, and fear. Uh, the, the, in, a, in one sense, Kinkora home, there was a political aspect as one of the three guys convicted had connections within unionism. Uh, he's quite prominent in, in certain, slightly eccentric end, but he was very significant in terms of youth, unionist youth, and he was a, an influential uh, preacher, and but also a groomer, probably, of... Uh, young men in, in, in the Unionist uh, Party, quite, quite significant numbers of whom uh, prospered in later life uh, politically. But uh, that that enabled a sort of conspiracy theory to develop and the, the newspapers gradually built up a whole series of uh, assertions about the home and what happened at it. And it got, well, it essentially got out of hand in the sense that it was the home in Belfast was actually about three miles from Stormont, and you know the stories became rampant that, that people, top political figures, top military figures, top civil servants, even Lord Mountbatten, 
was, you know, were stopping on the way to Stormont and uh, taking advantage of the of the boys at that home. The union got involved. Nipsa got involved. Uh, how did that come about? Like, and, and well, what was the aim of Nipsa getting involved? In uh, in the sort of uh, you know, the people got increasingly concerned that there was a whole world of uh, pedophilia and conspiracy to abuse children out there, and uh, to to meet that problem, uh, the Eastern Health Board, which is the Belfast Trust, really in charge of the health, adopted a policy of uh, not not just not employing gays in in homes, uh, children's homes, but in any caring role of any sort, and that was a huge significant step because considerable number of gay people, uh, uh, gay and lesbian uh, and bisexual were working in, in the public care sector and that's always been the case, always will be the case. Uh, so that was adopted and uh, the one voice that stood out against it in, in public was uh, Lawrence Pimley, who was a trade union official with Northern Ireland Public Service Alliance, the biggest public sector trade union in Northern Ireland. Uh, and he was courageous and, and spoke out at both at a gay conference in Belfast and, and otherwise uh, saying that this was uh, unconscionable policy and had to be uh, stopped for good reasons, good trade unions, it was his members that were being uh, sacked. And, and some, we discovered that a number of people were then sacked who were, who, who the authorities detected were gay, not because they'd done anything wrong, but simply because they were gay. And then it had also a huge chilling, chill effect that people, I mean, if you were gay and looking a job, well, you wouldn't apply there because you could see the future was going to be bleak, if not unpleasant, to, to say the least. So that, that policy lasted for a couple of years. And with the, the work of Lawrence Finley and Nipsa, uh, and uh, also the one member of the Eastern Health Board, a guy called James Fort Smith, uh, who worked in the Ulster Museum, was an art curator. He stood against the policy and eventually it went up to the Department of Health at Stormont, which was run at that time. The Prime Secretary was Morris Hayes, a very sensible guy, and he blocked it uh, and the policy was abandoned. But I think the damage was largely done and, and, and for many years it had a chill factor on, on employment of gay people throughout Northern Ireland. The, the, the protections that exist now in uh, Northern Ireland for workers who identify as LGBT uh, is completely different to what it used to be. Actually, the Republic was the first who introduced anti-discrimination rules for in employment. That was the moment when they overtook Northern Ireland in a sense. We got decriminalisation first, even um, my case had to be won for David Norris to win his case eventually in Strasbourg. But the anti-discrimination stuff started and the EU was probably quite significant as well. And that, that was involved. Um, but yes, since, I mean, now we've got gay friendly policies throughout, um, throughout so many employers and they, they have special events and pride weeks and, and in, internal groups who are uh, key to their policy making and so on. So we've moved from Criminal, uh, from being criminals to being respected members of society. Jeff, thank you very much for your time. Thanks for filling us in on that uh, situation. Um, and as always, it's good to see you. Um, now we're going to have a look at our uh, second case study, and we're joined by Orly Egan, a queer archival archivist, founder of Cork LGBT Archive, documentary filmmaker an author of Queer Republic of Cork. And there's a whole litany of other things I could put in there because she has such a long history in terms of LGBT act uh, activism in Ireland. Uh, Orla, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're going to look at the case of uh, Donna uh, uh, McAnallen, who was somebody who was working uh, in Cork back in the 90s. And they had an issue in terms uh, of uh, their employment after they were seen kissing their partner. Um, now, I'm going to let you fill in the details uh, more and then we can talk about it. So can you just give us uh, what the circumstances were? OK, so Donna McAnallen uh, is originally from Belfast, but lived in Cork in the 1990s. And she was employed by Brookfield Leisure Centre in Cork 
from September 1992 and employed as a lifeguard and a fitness instructor. And she was dismissed in April 1993 for allegedly kissing her girlfriend in the changing rooms of the leisure centre. Um, and it seems that a complaint was made um, by a member of the leisure centre that uh, she had been seen uh, kissing her girlfriend and management responded by dismissing Donna on the spot. Um, so in June 1993, Donna took a case to the Labour Court and she was supported in her case by solicitors Noonan and Linehan. Um, and basically before the, the Labour Court, uh, she claimed that her dismissal constituted a contravention of the 1990, uh, 1977 Employment Equality Act. Um, so she took the case to the Labour Court and it was heard in October 1993. So she's basically saying that um, she was dismissed because of her sexual orientation, uh, because of an alleged complaint about an alleged incident, and that basically if a man or a straight person had engaged in the same incident, had kissed their girlfriend, that they wouldn't have been dismissed. Um, so basically, uh, in the court case, uh, the kinds of points that they were putting forward was that she was discriminated against in circumstances where a male person doing the exactly the same action as she did would not have been dismissed. So if a man had been allegedly kissing his girlfriend in the changing room or anywhere on the premises, that he wouldn't have been dismissed for that action. Um, and then the second point that they made was that the Employment Equality Act at the time prohibited sexual harassment. And that under the European Commission Code of Practice on Sexual Harassment, it recognised that discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation must be seen as sexual harassment. And then the third point that they made was that the worker's sexual orientation, her lesbianism, was a characteristic unique to the female sex, and that actions based on that characteristic must constitute direct discrimination on the grounds of sex, and therefore should be covered by the Employment Equality Act that outlaw discrimination on the basis of sex. So that was the case that she put forward to the Labour Court. And obviously, Brookfield Leisure Centre said that's not the case. Um, and the judgment in this case was really interesting um, because they, they both found for her and against her. So they did find that she had been summarily dismissed, just dismissed on the spot because of a complaint by a client of the employer that the worker acted in a way in the course of her employment as to cause offence and to demonstrate her sexual orientation. So I'm not sure if they're saying there that just demonstrating the fact that you're lesbian or gay was an offence in and of itself or if the offence was the kissing. Um, so basically the court, the Labour Court found that she had been treated unfairly um, and that they were satisfied that she had been treated in an arbitrary and unfair manner and that she was given no opportunity to respond to the complaint that had been made, no opportunity to, if the, if the incident had happened, to alter her behaviour. Um, and even if she had done what she was you know, accused of doing, the court said that wasn't so serious a matter as to justify immediate dismissal. So um, they said at the very least, even if it had happened, she should have been given an opportunity as well to kind of change her behaviour to a manner deemed more acceptable in the employment. So in that sense, they did say that, you know, her, her dismissal was unfair and arbitrary and, and shouldn't have happened. But what they also <laughs> found was yeah. that it wasn't covered by the employment equality legislation as it existed at that time. So we're talking about early 1990s. So what was in force at that point was the 1977 Employment Equality Act, which just dealt with, with you know, gender and sex discrimination and didn't have the kind of range of areas that, that are now covered by employment and equality legislation in Ireland. Um, so they, the court found that the unfair manner in which she was treated did not amount to discrimination within the meaning of the Employment Equality Act. Um, 
they were satisfied that uh, the unfair treatment did not arise from any attribute of her sex, but of her sexual orientation. And that in all probability, a man would have suffered the same discrimination for a dissimilar display of his sexual orientation. So it's kind of this bizarre argument that basically, if a gay man had kissed his partner, he probably would have been dismissed as well. So therefore, it wasn't, okay. it wasn't sex discrimination. Um, and so it's like, you know, even though I think that the that she made and her solicitors made a very valid argument that you could interpret the discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation as being sex discrimination, the court found that you couldn't. So they basically said that um, it wasn't covered by the employment equality legislation because sexual orientation wasn't included in the act. But what that did do is that it strengthened the argument for the inclusion, explicit inclusion of sexual orientation under the new employment equality legislation that was being discussed and planned at the time. And there had been a campaign building for some time had been advocating for the inclusion of sexual orientation explicitly in the legislation, a campaign that was kind of being led by various LGBT organizations and trade unions and other social change organizations. So that campaign had been building anyway. So I think that Donna McAllen's case strengthened the argument for why we needed explicit inclusion of sexual orientation in the legislation. And the Minister for Equality and Law Reform at the time, Marvin Taylor, he indicated that he would be publishing a bill which would outlaw discrimination that, such as that suffered by Donna McAllen. So he was he was referring directly to the case um, um, following the judgment. And then in the 1998 Employment Equality Act, sexual orientation was included as one of the protected grounds. So I think this is a really important case for us to, to be highlighting because I think it did play a really, really strong part in uh, bringing about that really important legislative change of having sexual orientation explicitly uh, mentioned in both the Employment Equality Act and the Equal Status Act. But it was also raised in the European Parliament um, by the Irish MEP Mary Benatti. So there was a kind of debate going on around the Civil Liberties Committee's report that was recommending stronger protection for human rights and equal treatment of all, irrespective of nationality, religion, colour, sex, sexual orientation and other difference. So Mary Benatti directly raised um, Donna McAnallan's case in the European Parliament in February 1994. Um, and she said it was a very disturbing case and that as long as EU and national laws were weak, then discrimination could rear its ugly head. And she said that we still have a long way to go in terms of legislation in Ireland and other EU countries to ensure that overt discrimination does not take place in the workplace and everywhere else. Donna wasn't an activist in the sense that she didn't go out looking for this. Um, she found herself uh, uh, thrust into the situation and having to deal with it and then finding, like, I mean, for anybody, given the amount of publicity that was generating around it at the time and given the culture and societal uh, issues that there were around identifying as lesbian, gay or bisexual uh, was, was really, could be really difficult. You know, so, so we lived, we lived a generation where these were real dangers to us in terms of our family lives and our careers and things like that. So for her to go forward and take the case, I think it's just, it's a, it's a huge statement about her character that she was not prepared to let this go and that she was willing to stand up for it. Yeah, I mean, Donna's living in the UK now, um, so she's not in Cork anymore. But I think, you know, you're very right. I think it's such a, a testament to her character because it did take strength at that time to not just take a case, but she took a case very publicly. She yeah. had herself named. She did a lot of media coverage around it. So she was very um, public and open about the case that was happening. Um, and I think that that was not everybody would be in a position where they could do that. I know you and I could go on talking here for ages and ages and ages about all this yeah. stuff. And um, listen, have a great pride. Enjoy yourself and, and all Thank the best you. to everybody down there. Thank you. Take care. So here we are now on to our third case study. Uh, this time we're looking at the campaign to repeal Section 37.1 of the Employment Equality Act. Um, Joining me to discuss this uh, from the trade union side is Anne-Marie uh, Lillis, 
who is primary school teacher and member of the IMTO. She attended the inaugural meeting of the IMTO LGBT Teachers Group in 2004 and was actively involved in the group until 2016. She was chairperson from 2013 to 2015, and she is currently principal of Dunleary Educate Together National School. From the political side is Aon O'Riordan TD, Labour Party spokesperson on education, enterprise and trade, and campaigner to end Section 37-1. Aon, can I start with you first? Could you maybe just fill us in on uh, how you know, the um, employment equality legislation came about and why it was that this section was included in it? I, I can only assume, uh, as a lot of uh, departments are quite um, are quite conservative and are are quite careful as to, uh, I suppose, have pieces of legislation passed or not going to be end up in the courts. That the underpinning of the constitutional right of a school to uphold its ethos, which was the problem we had, had to be within employment equality legislation. So thirty seven one was an attempt to, I suppose in their minds, uh, safeguard the ethos of a religious institution or religious run school uh, or hospital. Um, and it had the effect, therefore, of um, not just LGBT plus uh, teachers or, or those working in the medical uh, environments feeling this kind of cold atmosphere, but also people who were, who were divorced, who were unmarried parents, anybody whose lifestyle did not fit with the uh, ethos uh, of a given school, uh, felt that they were uh, they could have their career uh, prospects, uh, you know, inhibited, and that was the case. Now, it was never the case that they could be fired, uh, but it was the case that legitimately, and I use these terms, you know, not in the way that I agree with them at all, but legitimately or legally, I should say, uh, that if somebody was to go for promotion. Uh, within a school environment and their lifestyle was known that that could be used against them because the inference would be given that they were uh, undermining the ethos of the school. Uh, so that was um, that was the, the the reason for it, I suppose, was to uh, protect that constitutional right. Uh, so what we had to do, uh, not just myself, but others in the political sphere, and, and, and this was very much driven by uh, the INTO, was to find a way to do this within the constitutional parameters, uh, but to free uh, teachers and others from this from this cold atmosphere that was created by 37.1. Amory, this affected your members particularly because the INTO being teachers, and as we know, a uh, significant number of the schools in this country are religious run. How did it impact your members? Yeah, I, I suppose the, the the great power that the thirty seven one had, you know, uh, was really its its ability to silence and to make LGBT teachers invisible. You know, um, uh, Sheila Crowley, the the first chairperson of the group, she 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 famously put it that it had a real chilling effect on LGBT teachers. You know, um, you you were always worried that that you know that if you were out in your school. Um, you know, could this impact on your chances of promotion? You know, if there was a, a post of responsibility coming up in your school or if there was a deputy principalship or a principalship coming up, you were wondering that, you know, if you were out in the same way as all of your colleagues, if you talked about your, your girlfriend or your partner or if you talked about socialing at, you know, gay events like, you know, the Pride Parade is coming up this weekend, you were always wondering that if you were, you know, open about these things, you know, could that actually be interpreted as undermining the ethos? Because I suppose that what was that that's what was really chilling about 37.1. You were kind of wondering what does actually undermining the ethos actually mean? And could being openly LGBT in your staff room, in your classroom, you know, could that be interpreted as undermining the ethos? So the effect it had was that the people didn't talk about, you know, their, their, their lives. It had the impact of, of, of isolating you in a way. Um, I had been teaching in my first primary school for, for 15 years. And, you know, over the course of the 15 years, I had been out to a small number of people. I'd been out to friends and family for, for, for many, many years. But, you know, never once was I asked, you know, about my, my girlfriend, Claire, at the time, my now wife. Um, but, you know, and that was kind of after almost 15 years of sitting in the same staff room as some of those people. Um, and, and it not only kind of silenced us, but one of the things it did was that it silenced 
all of our colleagues. It silenced those people who could have been our allies because, you know, it had a real impact on school culture. You were kind of wondering, nobody felt that they could speak about it. And, and also, obviously, from that, it would have had a knock-on impact with students who that you were teaching who may have identified as LGBT themselves um, and not having any role models that they could look at, you know, who were naturally there in front of them. That must have had an impact as well. It was really hard. No, absolutely. And, and I think that the role models, you know, we know are hugely important in, in children's lives. And, you know, I suppose keeping this part of yourself hidden that, you know, if there were any children in your class that, that, that you know, later in life identified as LGBT, you know, those role models didn't exist. Um, you know, and, and that was hard. That was hard. I remember years later, actually, um, bumping into a past pupil. Um, I, I was out in a restaurant in Dublin and, you know, the, the, this, this young man did identify as gay as an adult. And, you know, we had a great chat afterwards. But, you know, when I was in primary school, I, I often thought it would have been fantastic if I had been able to be open about who I was in exactly the same way as the rest of our colleagues. And for me, when the, the, the first notice about the LGBT teachers group appeared in the In Touch magazine in 2004. Um, you know, I can't begin to describe the impact that that had, you know, to, to see that the union was setting up a group for LGBT teachers. It was absolutely huge. And, you know, for, for, for me personally, it, it was life changing. Um, you know, I, I remember going to the first meeting. It was on the 26th of November in 2004. And, um, when I walked into that room full of teachers, there were, there were 14 teachers at that meeting and there were four officers of the INTO um, and John Carr was there. He, he was the general secretary at the time. And, you know, it was just, I was terrified. There was part of me was absolutely terrified, but the other side of it was, I felt like this huge relief that it was kind of like, oh, you know, this, this is actually going to be okay, you know, because yeah. um, certainly early on in my career, I would have kind of felt at times, you know, that. I, I seriously considered leaving the profession because I kind of felt, you know, actually, is there a place for somebody like me within the teaching profession? You know, so, so it was great, as I say, that night in 2004, um, it was just such a relief to get that support and kind of to know that I had the full backing of the union, should I need their support, you know, in, in a situation in school. Well, let, let's move on to the campaign to actually try and uh, r remove the section. Um, Aaron, can I come back to you for a second? There's a, there's a political aspect to this, because obviously, in yeah. order for this to uh, be changed, it needs some kind of legislation brought forward and things like that. When did you start getting involved in the, the, the campaign? Well, I was an ITO member. I was, I was a primary school teacher. And so, uh, as has been said, like 37-1 became a regular feature of political speeches, or sorry, I should say INTO speeches that might be given by um, high-profile INTO leaders. So at, at, you know, at Congress every year, uh, it was one of these uh, issues that the INTO wanted to see addressed. And I took great comfort from that, and that my union, the INTO, uh, was taking this stance. Um, and so when it came to Pride, we would go to the Pride Parade, and the INTO would be there in numbers, and this was the key demand, 37, one had to be amended or removed or repealed. And, and, and so there was a buildup of energy around it, and there was no oppo opposition to it. Like in, in fairness to the Irish political system, in other jurisdictions, you know, there's a big, a lot of heat around these issues. Nobody could really justify uh, it remaining, you know, uh, in its current form, uh, because of some of the rhetoric that you might hear in, in other jurisdictions, if you like. So when it came to government formation in 2011, and I was elected to TD, it was put in the programme for government that it would be addressed. Um, and there was other things happening. Senator Ava Power, who was a Fianna Fáil senator, uh, brought through her piece of legislation through the Shannon, uh, and I brought a piece of legislation through the Dáil. Uh, and so there was a bill of momentum around it. What was interesting was that there was no single member of the Oireachtas who was asking for the status quo and the difficulty we had was always going to be within the departments and how it was going to square with the constitution and all the rest of it but some very powerful things happened the INTO LGBT group went to our snooks run they met the president and then when a photograph was taken half the people stepped out of the photograph because they couldn't be identified in their own minds as being LGBT and teaching in a Catholic school so there are 
a huge number of wider questions as to why the religious you know, uh, influence is so strong in Ireland over primary schools or over hospitals, why it has to be that way. I've had situations and I know of situations where teachers who are unmarried, who are pregnant, have gone to their principals and saying, is my job okay? That's a bizarre thing for a public servant to have to um, experience, but we have. But that was the build-up. The INTO, uh, making, they making a priority, it being the, the singular issue of pride, uh, and then the political system catching up, and then a programme for government uh, commitment. And the very first time I addressed the Dáil in terms of promised legislation, there's a section uh, in the Dáil schedule every day where you get to ask the Taoiseach any question about promised legislation. And that was the first question I asked, was this commitment in, in the programme for government uh, on 37.1? And he answered in a positive way. And we got to work, but the work is on, on legislation and amending it is a lot of copies of the constitution and trying to make sure it doesn't get a challenge in the in the high court and uh, and trying to convince people that amending it is going to be better than repeating it. And those hard discussions that sometimes don't make you feel great, uh, but the end goal is actually to make people feel less of the chilling effect, as Amory has, has said. Amory, it's now gone. Um, you're now a principal of a school, and here you are appearing in public, identifying as a member of the LGBT community and talking about this issue. Generally speaking, what impact, like, what do you think this will mean now for future teachers and particularly young LGBT people in school who also might want to go on and be teachers as well? Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, the, as Aon said, you know, the, the, the removal of 37.1 was our, you know, was our original objective. Um, but the amendment that has been put in is very, very strong. And what I would say to, to, to any person contemplating a career in education, absolutely go for it, because this amendment protects all teachers, regardless of the school that you teach in. I know a large percentage of our schools are under Catholic patronage at, at the moment, but this amendment protects teachers working in all primary schools. And I think that that's really, really important. Um, it's not like, you know, I, I'm working in an Educate Together school, um, but every school in the country must comply with this amendment. Um, you know, and, and, and I think that, that this amendment gives great certainty. And, you know, and, and I would appeal to people to trust the amendment. Um, you know, the legislative change has taken part, but what needs to happen, and I suppose which takes a little bit longer, is that cultural change within schools. And I, th mm. I, I still think that that cultural change, you know, it, 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 it's happening. It's beginning to take place, but it will take a little bit longer. Um, but what we have behind us is very, very solid uh, uh, legislation that, that, that protects all LGBT teachers, regardless of the school that they work in. And of course, we have to acknowledge the great role that the INTO played in making sure that that's what happened. Can I wish both of you, or can I first of all thank both of you for, for taking part in this and wish both of you a very happy Pride this coming weekend. Uh, I know Aon is a great ally of the LGBT community and uh, I, I, you know, I've marched with them on the parade uh, on occasions as well. So uh, wish you both a great weekend. Thanks again for being on our podcast. Uh, we're joined now by Sarah Phillips, who's the chair of Transgender Equality Network Ireland. Alan Murphy, who is a shop steward in Leinster House. Um, she is a former secretary uh, of the Abortion Rights Campaign Ireland and an LGBT rights activist. And then from the FSU, our own uh, Garrett Murphy, who's head of industrial relations and campaigns. Garrett, can I come to you first? Because maybe what we might do is just go with a kind of a, an overview of the situation. Is it safe to say that the L that LGBT people are fairly well covered in terms of rights and protections related to their employment? Um, I think there are basic rights and protections there um, in place that effectively say you can't be discriminated against on the grounds of uh, your gender or your sexual orientation. There's actually nine grounds, but gender and sexual orientation are two of the nine grounds. And that's, it's kind of a negative protection in that it says you shouldn't be treated less favorably in the areas of maybe pay, uh, recruitment for a job. So when you go for a job interview and general working conditions. Um, but that's not to say that prejudice, discrimination, harassment, uh, bullying and things like that 
don't happen because they they do happen and that's the sad uh, reality that um, our colleagues in the LGBT community face in work, there is still is prejudice and there still is discrimination. So while the law is, is formally there in terms of equality, um, there's a long way to go in terms of winning real meaningful uh, equality, fairness and decency in the workplace for uh, LGBT people. Can, can we deal with some of the basics? If, if I'm applying for a job, um, am I required to have to reveal my LGBT identity to an employer? And no, you're not. So you're not required to. And the only reason, obviously, it's 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 up to individuals to decide what they, they want to do in terms of um, their identity. And um, the, the only reason really you should ever disclose kind of personal information like that is if you think it's going to impact on your work and you may require kind of things that are reasonable adjustments to your workplace. I mean, that wouldn't apply to sexual orientation or gender, but you know, it may be some other consequence that you feel a reasonable adjustment might be required. And that's a situation where you may choose uh, to reveal to your employer. So in order to get some support or some assistance, um, but you don't have to. Um, and it, it's totally your choice. H having said that, a lot of employments now will have employee networks or a lot of unions will have union groups that you may wish to get involved in, get involved in. And so, you know, absolutely, you know, disclosing your, 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 your gender or your sexual orientation is to your advantage to do. So you don't have to, but you may choose to, and it may be, you know, it may be good for you to do, uh, but it's your, it's, I think the most important thing is that you're deciding to do it for a positive reason rather than being made to it. And what about in terms of health issues? So uh, particularly um, in relation to HIV, if, if I was somebody living with HIV, would I have to reveal that information to my employer? Um, so I suppose, again, like I said, you, you don't have to. Um, and I believe many people live with H HIV in work and it has absolutely no impact on their ability to work um, at all. And so this may never need to be a question. Um, however, like any illness uh, or condition uh, or disability, if it's going to impact on your work, then it can be advisable to seek reasonable adjustments. And, and that, what that really is, that's making your work and your working conditions work for you and work around you rather than you having to bend and you having to change to suit the work. It's try to actually make work suit you. So if whatever it is, HIV or another um, illness, disability, condition, et cetera, if that's going to impact on your work, you may want to disclose it in order to get reasonable adjustments. But if it isn't, then absolutely, you, you don't have to. Uh, it, and again, it just comes back to it's your decision. In terms of if you experience uh, discrimination or, or bullying, let's say, from other people in work, is, is your employer uh, obligated to have to um, support you in that situation? So join a union. So your union is the thing that's most there to support you in your workplace whatever it is right so sometimes people think hr are there to be on your side they're not really hr are there to make sure the minimal legal protections are in place and the employer actually isn't exposed to the risk of litigation that's really hr's job our job as a trade union not just our job but the community of trade unionists are there to make work a better more positive more decent experience alan I'm an employee in a situation where I'm being bullied by other employees or, or by my, my boss or my employer directly. Um, I come to you, what happens? What do I do? What, how does this process work? So the first thing as shop steward that I would do is um, have a discussion with yourself about what's gone on, ask you if you've kept a record of what's been going on. But it, while obviously the unique nature of being a member of the queer community is that when you receive bullying and experience bullying in work on those on those grounds it's exceptionally personal and and, and it as is all kind of bullying work but it's it's it is innately personal issue so of course i'd be quite sensitive towards that but there are some basics that absolutely every employee no matter what the issue is no matter what your sexual orientation no matter what your gender identity is that you're entitled to you're entitled to i would go to hr and i would get a copy of the processes so HR as 
Gareth has mentioned there, they are employed by the same employer that you are, but they are employed for them, not necessarily for you. But they do cover those processes. So I would get a copy of that. We discuss everything that had happened. I'd ask if you'd be comfortable writing it down. And then there's a bunch of different avenues that we can go down. You can go down a formal complaints avenue. Your workplace may have a, mitigate, uh, a mediation option. We can look at that. Bearing in mind that you, as again, as anyone else, would not be mandated to do mediation, and mediation is entered into voluntarily and is non-binding. So it is a case that if you want to give it a go, you can, but absolutely you're not going to be forced in any way to sit in a room with someone who's been bullying you and listen to them do it again. Um, and as your shop steward, I would be there to support you through all of this, to advise you through all of this. Uh, if we needed further advice, legal advice from the union, or particularly in the case of individual discrimination cases, you might need more detailed advice. We would refer that through by the shop steward through the official. Um, but the main thing is to remember for anyone listening that your gender identity and your sexual orientation and your personal and your private life is, is as valid a reason for you to come to your union rep as it is any other issue. If it is causing an issue in work, it is causing an issue for your union. And as your union shop steward, we're as much there for you on that ground as we are for anybody else. So if anyone's listening and thinking, well, maybe that's not relevant, it is relevant. You're a worker, and if you're being made feel uncomfortable in work for any reason, you need to go to shop steward. And as Gareth said, the first step to all of that is joining your union. We've kind of focused mostly on the individual in what we've talked about so far, but uh, none of us are really individuals in our real life situations and we have family in different situations. And in recent years, I think um, the LGBT community has experienced a growth in the numbers of um, same sex headed families. Um, but there, but our same sex headed families covered by the legislation the same as uh, opposite sex headed families. Unfortunately, I mean, in the main, yes, as, as Gareth pointed out, there are bases for discrimination which are covered by this. Um, it, it's, one of, it's two of the identified um, grounds. However, a lot of the legislation which dictates our lives at work around things like parental leave, maternity leave, sick leave, those things weren't, and family leave, were never really designed with queer people in our community in mind. And the fact that gender plays a role in access to paid leave, when you're having kids, paternity leave, um, that's that's definitely an issue. And there is a move, particularly by opposition parties, but also by government, some decent people in government who are pointing this out and the fact that we need to adjust our working regulations to reflect the fact that you might have the same, you know, you know, a, 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 a two gendered led, same, fa same gender led family. So who has paternity leave in the issue in the case of trans community accessing things like maternity leave and paternity leave and parental leave is also very difficult so actually um another really good example that affects a lot of people in the community is access to pregnancy loss leave and i and loss um uh, miscarriage leave after ivf and marie sherlock is currently progressing legislation that would allow everyone and anyone who has to go through ivf which many many of us in the community do have to do to have kids can have that access to time off so there's definitely a lag in the in the in the legislation to represent all families and we saw that after marriage quality as well when you had marriage quality but then there were subsequent issues around pensions and recognitions of long-term partners and there still are parental recognition issues as well um so there's definitely a lag but the union movement is an active part of that lobbying to see that change and that's why it's coming from usually left-wing unionists union pro-union parties who are pushing this agenda so again it's just another good reason to join your union and to make sure that your experience is counted when we're making those policy proposals to government and opposition parties Sarah can I come to you now at this point because um I think I, I mean correct me if I'm wrong but um I wonder if for the trans community there are other more um, complicated issues that might be involved in terms of being an employee and maybe maybe at a later stage in life um, deciding that you uh, want to begin transitioning and what that might involve. In your work in Tenny, what kind of experiences have you come across of people? Yeah, and thanks, 
Uh, Carl, I just want to go back maybe to something Garrett said sure. about the main grounds of, of discrimination, and that's something that's key from a trans perspective, is that there's an assumption under the nine grounds, specifically under the gender ground, that transgender people are covered under that ground. Um, and that's based on specifically a legal case that was taken by uh, Louise Hannon back in 2011, but it was taken through the Equality Authority and therefore there's no precedent on it. So there isn't really precedent set that the inclusion of gender identity or gender expression within those that gender ground covers a trans person. There's an assumption. We've seen some cases go through the Workplace Commission, which have all been found positively. So that's really reassuring. However, that's not a guarantee. And so in the review of the Equality Status and Employment Acts at the moment that are going on, uh, we are trying to ensure that the words gender identity, gender expression, and sex characteristics uh, are included in that legislation because that would then explicitly cover the trans community from discrimination, specifically in employment. Um, I suppose from what you mentioned about you know, the experience of the trans community within uh, the workplace, it's quite, uh, it's quite complicated in lots of ways. Um, you know, you have a mixed um, results basically from people trying to access work in the first place, but also then also trying to transition in the workplace. And one of the key things, especially with people trying to transition in the workplace, there's a lot of companies don't really have policies within within their diversity and inclusion policies that again explicitly support the trans person in the workplace about uh, you know transitioning. So you know again going back to something Garrett said earlier about you know maybe outing yourself at the interview stage or at the employment stage. You know a trans person coming into employment may need to do that if they've already transitioned, but they may still be within that space. They may need to take some time off for uh, medical treatment, et cetera, and they may need some support around that. But a lot of companies would not have, you know, taken that into account in their policies. So it's about trying now to work with a lot of companies, make sure that there are explicit uh, and understandable policies in place, that people know what their rights are. Um, and again, working with your union specifically and, and unions in this situation have been unbelievably supportive over the years to the trans community. Um, you know, going back to SIP2 support of our very first ever, you know, guidelines around trans inclusion in the workplace many, many years ago. But I think the key piece now is, is that companies need to live that culture. It's not just about producing a document, letting people know that you're supportive, but it's also that individuals within the company know that this is available, not, not just the trans people, but it's also about your colleagues and the management, et cetera. So I think there's a, there's a big piece of work that's, that has to be had that has to happen here, um, starting from companies being open to hire trans people. You know, some of the data talks about 49% of trans people being unemployed, but 24% of not even wanting to apply for a job for the simple reason that they're afraid of the unconscious bias or the screening out of them at the interview or, or at the employment stage. So there's a huge body of work there to do at the moment. And, and we've been trying to work with some really key employers and, and associations, et cetera, to try and start that work going. In terms of like some of the points that you were making there, is there a need for legislation in order to ensure that trans people um, in employment are protected and covered? Or do you think that it's just about changing culture and uh, people's understanding? I think, I think, as I mentioned just earlier on, I think it's definitely uh, twofold. I think there, there's a clear need for legislation, there's no doubt about that. I think there's also a need for that, that protection within the, the grounds of discrimination. And I think then also there is a lot of work to be done both, I suppose, within the workplace around diversity and inclusion policies, but also within the workplace culture. Because again, for most part, most employees don't experience a trans person in the workplace very often because there's not that many of us in the first place. Um, so, you know, I think I think there's a, as I said earlier, it's a huge amount of work that has to be done uh, societally 
uh, to understand the trans community's needs, but also to protect them when they're going into the workplace. And I do think, again, there are ways of doing that. There, are, there is legislative ways, there is uh, cultural ways, there's policy ways, but there's also then benefiting, you know, the support of, of your union as well. Um, and I think in that situation, it's about bringing all of those things together as quickly as we possibly can. I'm going to come back to Gareth and Ellen in just a second, just to uh, ask them about what role the unions can play. But I know, uh, Sarah, that uh, Tenny has been involved with IBEC in producing some guidelines and, and uh, uh, some information for employers. Can you give us a kind of a rough outline as to what what that involves? What what kind of things have you identified for employers? Yeah, again, I, I think you know there, there's there's quite a bit of work in the actual policies that we've suggested to IBEC and to other companies that we work with. Um, you know, one of them is transitioning in the workplace. If you look at that, because a lot of companies will focus on that piece specifically. It's about educating the company, being proactive rather than reactive. In other words, looking at the fact that you may not have a trans person in your workplace but you still should be looking at training your staff, training your HR department, training your management team and providing information, you know, around what it means to be trans in the workplace. And then including that in your policies before you have to deal with somebody who may come out within the workplace. Then secondly, then having a policy and a support system for the trans person, if they do come out, so that they, they understand what are the steps that they can avail of. Also, don't always, a piece of that would be always not expecting the trans person to design what that pathway might be, so that, that it's worked in partnership between the individual and the company at all times. And, and again, I go back to your union, can support you through that as much as anything. But I think it's about that working together approach. This is one of the things that we've done, you know, People who pick out things within the, the IVAC policy, for instance, will talk about, you know, education. Education is not about at the time of the person coming out. It's about a general education beforehand, as I say, being proactive. And then the other part of it was about looking at hiring policies, understanding maybe some of the nuances of what, it, what might uh, affect a trans person applying for a job. One, are you being very open about your hiring policies? Are you welcoming to the trans community? And then secondly, are you understanding what somebody might put in their CV or what they're bringing to the table? For instance, sometimes trans people would have gaps in their CV because they'll have taken time out maybe to transition and will have gone through all that medical process. And you may wonder about that and ignore it, but rather than actually progressing it and talking to them, you need to have an understanding maybe what this means. Not all trans people want to be out in the workplace. That's the other thing. They want to keep that information to themselves. They may bring it out to the management or to the HR department, but they don't necessarily need it, you know, broadcast across the whole of the company. So it's about learning all of those sort of uh, things. And that's that's kind of the advice that we've been giving, uh, about not just to IBEC, but to also many of the other companies that we deal with. Gareth, I'm not sure if you had anything you want to add to that. I mean, we, we did mention earlier around uh, the issue of HIV and that uh, for someone. I know one of the big things today in terms of HIV is to break down the stigma that still attaches and understand that uh, these days getting a HIV diagnosis is really about uh, learning to live with a, a lifelong chronic illness. But is there, is there a role for unions in terms of better awareness and training and understanding for either other em, uh, employees uh, or employers? Um, there is, yeah, I suppose. And I'll, I'll take the issue of kind of breaking down stigmas or creating better awareness and, and how, what we can do as a trade union. So we had a, an example of a case I was involved in, uh, an individual case, but that turns into something more collective and positive. From a number of years ago, um, which was a, a gay man and his partner and um, member of ours were uh, starting their family through um, surrogacy and um, there basically was no leave and no supports in place uh, for him um, to avail of from his, his employer. It was a good number of years ago. Um, the employer was, was, was fairly decent and well-meaning in that 
they they wanted to provide leave, but they they kind of didn't have the tools or mechanisms to do it. So they they somewhat um, bluntly uh, put him on maternity leave, um, which meant he got he got paid, <laughs> so which was which was great. So he got leave and he got paid leave. Um, but he, he was a man on maternity leave, kind of a, a, a bit annoyed about that, I suppose. Um, but what it meant and what it, it, it allowed us to do was we, we obviously talked to the employer and, and they, 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 they were well-meaning. They had wanted to provide him support and to get leave in place and make sure he wasn't at loss of income, which was great. Um, but then they went away and they put, put in place a, a surrogacy leave policy, um, which then we had to learn as well. And, and, and I had a lot of learning to do through engaging with my member and listening to them and them telling me the supports they needed. And obviously the employer, and they were able to engage, I can't remember with who at the time, but with advocacy groups. And it meant then they could take their well-meaning, keep someone in, in, in the payroll, keep them getting paid, but turn it into a collective policy that then they can put out on the internet, et cetera, and um, to all of their staff. So that's a an individual union member with my support me being able to learn and listen and understand because it was an area that I, 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 I didn't know myself. And, you know, as a trade union official, you're often put into areas that you, you don't know the person's experience. But the one thing you have to do is listen. You have to learn and then you have to go, right, well, how can I help this situation? That's what you're there to do. And that was an employer who was good enough equally to go, well, we want to do the right thing. So how can we how can we do this? Maybe in the short term, but then actually correct us and have a better policy in place. So that's an example, um, a real example from a good number of years ago of, of how an individual issue can be turned into a much positive collective learning, breaking down stigmas, you know, educating, teaching in our union, but then more generally within the workforce and within the staff as well. So again, if they hadn't have been the union member, you know, that might not have happened. So I think the, the importance of, of being in a trade union is there. Alan, before we finish up, can I just ask you, did you have anything that you may want to add to that in terms of what role unions can have in, um, in, in terms of breaking down issues around LGBT community? Well, I think um, the nail was sort of hit on the head by Zara when she said we have to be proactive, not reactive. And I think in a, generally my experience as being a shop steward has been that while being very well-meaning, as many places are, as Gareth said, a lot of places will wait for an issue to arise and then decide how to react to it. And usually it's reacting to something with time limits, with um, under pressure, with emotions running high, because there is really nothing as stressful in work as going through disruption in work and going through a tough time at work, which is usually when you're meeting people as a shop steward. I don't get to meet them on their happiest days usually. So I really think that to bridge that gap, it's important for us as unions to make sure that we're being proactive. So when we go to an HR rep with an issue on behalf of a member and they say, well, I haven't the foggiest how to deal with this. Like, well, that's why ICTU and SIP2 and the FSU with alongside groups like Tenny and Belong to have put in the work to give you templates like that template that, that Gareth now has for the surrogacy leave. And I think it's really important that we're proactive because if the employers are being reactive and we're being reactive, there's nobody then in that room able to advocate for the person in the crisis. And again, as Sarah said, it shouldn't be up to the person who's going through this at work to then hold all of our cans collectively and bring it through. We need to be proactive about it. And we also need to make sure that any work that we do as unions on that, that that is given at the grassroots level to shop stewards. Because while I'm a community member and someone who, you know, like spending her Saturdays at lectures about gender identity and, and such. That's my idea of fun. Not every shop steward in every workforce will have that at their fingertips. So it's really important that we ingrain that as part, I think, as part of our standard training, as we all get training as shop stewards, some of the issues that you're going to face are going to be these, and this is what you do. And if you don't know what to do, this is who you talk to in the union. Um, but yeah, I think it's about us being proactive because we can't wait for our employers to be, unfortunately. Well, I said at the beginning we wouldn't be able to cover all the different issues that people may want to hear about. And I hope what we've at least been able to do is to kind of encourage people to uh, look at uh, getting help and, and, and that um, maybe even think about joining a union in order to be able to have representation if they feel that they need to have that behind them. Uh, one of the things I'm delighted to be able to say is that the FSU runs an advice centre. 
um, and uh, we will be making that available to people who have specific questions uh, or issues that they want to get information on. Uh, following this, the information on how to contact the Advice Centre will be coming up, so please stay on to have a, a look at that. In the meantime, can I thank Sarah? Alan and Gareth for their time coming on here and I think really helping to uh, throw some light on the issues that people have to face in terms of um, employment and their LGBT identity. So thank you very much and I wish you all a very happy Pride.